Our scripture reading this morning is from Colossians chapter 3, and we're going to read Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 21. I want to thank uh, Brother Tally for filling in today. Brother Greg Matthews will fill in next week in Brother Drew's absence. Each Sunday morning, I usually pray for a church in my pastoral prayer after reading the text. This morning, I'll be praying for a church that recently um, closed its doors, Hepzibah Baptist Church, south part of the county, the Emerson community. Many of you are aware of this historic church. It produced members of this church. Among those members are Brother Greg Matthews and Brother Bruce Malick, who are today leading in homecoming services. The church has closed its door, but people are regathering there today to celebrate the history of that church and its impact on people's lives. And I'd ask you to pray for these deacons in our church as they're leading in that, um, that gathering, that reunion today. Demographics and economy has affected the rural areas of Arkansas, hasn't it? But the Lord's church continues on. His word endures. And here this morning we hear his word in Colossians chapter 3. If then you have been raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these, you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. Put on then as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, compassionate hearts, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, As the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all these, put on love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing with one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting in the Lord. Husbands, love your wives and do not be harsh with them. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. Fathers, do not provoke your children, lest they become discouraged." Father, thank you for your enduring word and bless it as it is preached globally today. And as we think, Father, closer to home, we are grateful for gospel preaching churches. And we pray you will bless gospel preaching churches throughout Columbia County today. And Father, as people gather again, reunite today at Hepzibah, we pray your blessings upon them. We're thankful for the continuing impact of that church whose doors are now closed. But we pray today would be a great day for them. Bless Brother Matthews and Brother Malik as they lead in worship today there. And Father, bless here. May your word resonate in our hearts. May your spirit compel us to repentance and to obedience. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. It is Family Month at first. We've designated June as Family Month. Uh, Part of that is on Wednesday evenings. We're having family uh, dinners on Wednesday evenings, and you're invited to that. You just need to RSVP according to the deadline in your bulletin. 
uh, so that we will know how much food to have, but we'd love for you to come. We're eating together on Wednesday nights and then kind of uh, introducing what's coming that Sunday and uh, talking a little bit about that just to encourage families. That's all we want to do. And so plan uh, to come and be with us uh, this week with that. We're also going to be preaching uh, this month a little series, three-part series that I have entitled Family Matters. Now, to start with this morning, we want to, uh, we want to encourage families, not only in the sermons and the dinners, but we want to encourage families with good books. Uh, we want to encourage you with good books. And so I've got a couple of good books that we're going to give away uh, here this morning. Y'all like free stuff? Yeah. Do you like to read? Do you? Okay, some of you, hey, there you go. Whoever that was, okay, you're my kind of person, all right? All right, you're my kind of person. So I want to ask a question this morning, because uh, I've got to determine how I'm going to give some of this stuff away. Is there anybody in here who right now is engaged to get married? You're engaged officially, the ring's on her finger. Anybody? Tanner? Okay. Come here, Tanner. <laughs> See, he wouldn't have raised his hand if, I, if he knew I was going to make him get up. Well, he's kind of stuck back in there, isn't he? But I think you stand, just stand up. Is your fiance here? Stand up. Taylor, right? This is Tanner and Taylor. Thank you, brother. There they are. Congratulations. They're having a, a shower, I think, this afternoon. Is that right? Congratulations. Anybody else engaged to get married? Where? Somebody's pointing. Well, well, come here. You're standing right there. You come here. Is this your fiance? Okay, who are you? <laughs> You're Bob's daughter, aren't you? God bless you for that, sweetheart. Y'all having a shower today, too? All right. Y'all shower's on site, too, isn't it? Yeah. Congratulations. Congratulations, Bob. That's great. All right. Wow. Congratulate them. Isn't that great? Yeah. Now, y'all, congrat anybody else engaged? Anybody disengaged? Okay, well, that's for some of you married a little bit longer. But uh, we want to congratulate these two couples. The book that I gave them, uh, and we'll give out a couple more as the month goes along, is entitled The Meaning of Marriage. It's written by Timothy Keller. It's one that I recommend and use extensively in marriage counseling. Now, a couple other books I want to give away. And uh, is there, and we're going to do this a little bit different, is there a grandparent in the room? No, there's more. Is there a grandparent in the room who has had a grandchild in the past year? You've got a baby grandchild in the past year. Anybody? Anybody? A couple of you over here. How many are there? Because I've got, I've only got, I've got five books. How many hands do I see? I don't have enough books. There's too many. How many of you have one in the last six months? <laughs> last six months. One, two, three. Okay. Four. And five, I got five books. Is that, is that everybody's hand? All right, I got five books. Here we go. Y'all ready? Okay, stand up so we can find you. There's a couple on this side, Brother Dunlap. And, and there's, there's two up in the, they're up at the balcony. I'll go up there. Okay. The, this, book, this book is the biggest story. Kevin DeYoung wrote it. It's a great book for the Bible story. How many we got down here? Huh? You ready? Okay. I tell you what, if I don't have enough and I may run out, I will get them for you, okay? I will get you one. You already ordered it for your grandchild? Well, bless you. I'll get you something else. All right. Thank you. I'm sorry I, I didn't have enough. I never expected that many grandbabies in six months. Wow. I'm jealous. I am extremely jealous of every one of you. This morning's sermon, congratulations, but isn't that great, having babies and all? I just love that. It's great. This morning, the title of the sermon is, is uh, entitled Facebook Family. Facebook Family. Now, you know how Facebook works, right? Um, this is typically what you see on Facebook. Yeah. By the way, I have their permission, Okay. I stole it off Facebook, and then I asked them, and they said it was okay. And, and, and the reason this is what you see, the baby is looking directly at the cam camera. Mom and Dad, you know, it's just such a beautiful picture. It's, it just moves you, doesn't it? Now, here's the thing. Most of us, that's all we want on Facebook. We don't show anything else, right? You don't see what was happening 
10 seconds before or 10 seconds after the photo. How many of y'all know what I'm talking about? You know what I'm talking about? Yeah, exactly. Now, one thing that I love about, uh, uh, about uh, the Russells, Brother Drew and Sister Amber, is, is that they are honest. And so they also put stuff like this on Facebook. <laughs> Ava did not care that her daddy had gotten an MBA. I, all she wanted was what she wanted, right? Uh, but, but they're not afraid just to put real life out there. A lot of us are afraid to put real life out there, and that's why we're calling this the Facebook life, because a lot of us, a lot of our families, we live lives. We live lives that look one way in public, but are something entirely different behind the scenes. Now, sometimes I'm asked this question. Why do kids grow up and leave church? And I think there's more than one reason that that happens some. And I, I'm not, there's so many different studies. I don't know how many actually do, but some do. And, and one reason, honestly, is because, well, some kids grow up and don't believe Jesus. And, and you can have a perfect home. You can do everything right. You won't, but you could. If you could, you could. And yet your children grow up and respond to Christ differently because every child becomes an adult who is responsible for their own response to God right and you can't make anyone be anything and being a Christian family does not ensure your children to be Christian another reason that some kids grow up and and leave the church is because they are hurt in the church they're hurt physically mentally emotionally there's a big to do right now about physical abuse and sexual assault within the Southern Baptist Convention. But let me tell you something, dear friend. What has happened is not a Southern Baptist issue. It is a church life issue. And, and there was a time when, when we would sweep things under the rug and we would try to hide things and let's not talk about this, talk about that, because the image of the church mattered more than the well-being of the vulnerable. God help us to put an end to that. But the third reason, and I think the most significant reason that kids end up leaving the church when they grow up is because they grow up in Facebook families even before Facebook was a thing. Long before Facebook and Instagram came around, kids were growing up in Facebook families where the lives that they lived at home and the lives that they lived in church were, were different from the images that were projected. The reality behind the scenes was far different than what was projected and shown on the stage. And that's what I want to talk to us about this morning. Now, we read a large section of the text today, and really only four verses dealt immediately with family. But understand, that the entire flow of this text is important. This letter is a letter to a church. It's a letter to a church about the preeminence of Christ in 1, 15 through 18, the reconciling work of Christ in 1, 19 and 20, how Christ has made us alive in 2, 13, 14, and how Christ has set us free from all authorities and power over our lives in chapter 2 and verse 15, so that Chapter 3, verse 18, through really the first verse of chapter 4, is an outflow of that. It is an application of that to two big areas, really the main areas of life. And one is your family, and the other is your work, how you keep a roof over your head. Verses 18 through 21, those familiar verses about family, about mom and dad and husband and wife and all that. They don't stand alone in this text, and in fact, they will not work apart from the rest of the text. It all flows together. So let's consider that very familiar passage of verses 18 through 21, you know, wives submit, husbands love, kids obey, and dads encourage. Let's consider that in light of the first 17 verses of this chapter, and let's see what happens with it this morning. As we consider that, I would draw your attention, first of all, to the first four verses where what we need to see in that this morning is that there is a call for us to reprioritize 
our lives. If you be raised in Christ. So this is written to those who have experienced the life-giving power of Christ who has broken the chains of bondage and, and sin from their lives. And he says to them, if you've been raised in Christ, if that's you, and since it is you, then you need to be seeking, desiring, and pursuing not the things of earth, but the things of heaven where Christ is. And you need to be setting your minds on and concentrating not on the things of earth, but on the things of heaven that endure. In fact, he makes the argument here that Christ is going to come from heaven. And so if Christ is coming from heaven, then pursuing, desiring the things of earth in the end would be utter foolishness. Because all of those things are perishing, but who Christ is and the things of Christ will endure forever. Now understand, he's not saying here that enjoying the good things of earth that God has given us to enjoy is wrong. But ladies and gentlemen, it is wrong. In fact, it is idolatry to pursue those things. It is idolatry to set your heart on those things, whatever they may be. Because when you do, by default, you're not pursuing Christ. You're not setting your heart on Christ. And Christ is not on the throne of your life. Now, dear friend, listen. Your priorities are evident in what you pursue. Your priorities are evident in what you pursue. You see, sometimes we like to project, well, these are my priorities. Christ is my priority. His church is my priority. Being what he wants me to be is my priority. But our life would argue against it. And here's the thing. Your family knows that. Your kids know that. And people around you know that. You can rationalize it all you want to, but everybody else sees your life and understands what your priorities really are. You say, well, I really don't know what my priorities are. How can I find out? Let me ask you three questions. One, what's in your mind? I mean, what are you thinking about all the time? What drives your life? What pushes your life? What is it that you're after? And thirdly, what commands your time? What commands your time? Now, you answer those three questions and you will find the priorities of your life. You're going to find out what everybody else already knows. And parents, you're going to find out what your kids already know. Because what, do, what is, makes your priorities evident is what you pursue, not what you say. Okay? Number two. The text calls us to reorient our lives in verses 5 through 16 from doing what is earthly to being what is holy. From doing what is earthly to being what is holy. What is earthly? Well, we find that in verse 5, sexual immorality. That's the first thing out of the gate. And that word refers to any kind of sexual activity outside of the marriage of a man and a woman. A Genesis 2 marriage. Anything outside of that is sexual immorality. And then he adds other words, impurity, passion, and evil desire. And these words refer refer to ungodly, earthly passions, lusts, desires, and pursuits. Oftentimes these words are used in conjunction with sexual immorality, but they also extend to any other kind of ungodly passion and pursuit. It may be greed, money, covetousness, it may be... It may be power, whatever it is. And isn't it strange how all of those things, sexual immorality, greed, a desire for power, all of these kind of things keep intersecting in life, don't they? They keep running into. Why? Because they're all rising up from the same place within us. But then he goes on to also say in verses 8 and 9, anger, malice, obscene talk, lying. And isn't it strange how all of those things tie back and are found with all the other things? And here's the deal. All of those things that I just read to you are things that families deal with. These are things that go on in family life today. These are the struggles of family. Affairs. Right? Affairs. Porn, the addiction of porn that has swept 
across not only our country, but across our churches. These things are found. Passions for greed, passions for power. Obscene talking, lying, anger being expressed at people. All of these things are found in families that are in churches. And we project an image otherwise, but behind the scenes, what's experienced with husband and wife and children growing up in home is often different than what is projected. He calls on us to leave all of that behind and instead to reorient our lives toward holiness, compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, patience, bearing with one another, forgiving one another as the Lord has forgiven Love, peace, thankfulness, the teachings of Christ dwelling richly in us so that we teach and admonish one another in all wisdom, singing, and thankfulness. <laughs> wow. That is the image we try to project. But what is the reality behind it? Many church families have a Facebook holiness while pursuing earthly lives. And many churches have the same thing because they are comprised of families who are more concerned about what they are on the stage of life than what they are off the stage of life. Now listen to me. Who you really are is who you are off stage. That's who you really are. Listen, I'm tickled to death you're here this morning, and I pray this sermon applies to nobody in this room. But I'm going to tell you, who you are is not who you are sitting in the pew that right now. Who you are is who you are at home this week. Who you are is who you are when you get up in the morning, when you interact with your spouse, when you interact with your kids, when you interact with your grandchildren. Who you are is what you are in the home. And and that's my question this morning. Who are you? And here's the thing. Your family knows it. You can take your kids to church every Sunday. But here's the thing. Your kids know what you are Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. And do not think for a moment that taking them to church on Sunday will overcome your influence the other six days of the week. Because it won't. I love parents, you know, the kids grow up and, and, and they go off and do crazy things. And people say, well, you know, the church just let my family down. Hogwash. Don't believe that for a second. You think that an hour or two or three out of all the hours in a week at church are going to overcome the outside influences on them, both in your home and wherever you let them go? No way. Your kids know, your grandkids know, your spouse knows who you are. And if you've been raised with Christ, you're to have different priorities and your life is to be reoriented around being holy instead of earthly. Number three, the text calls upon us to redirect our lives. Verse 17, it calls on us to redirect our lives from from living in our name for our glory By our will to living in Jesus' name for His glory according to His will. What does it mean to live for the name of Christ? It means doing everything, everything that we do in the name of the Lord Jesus because of who Jesus is, because what Jesus has done for us in raising us up from the dead by the cross, forgiving us of our sins, canceling out our sin debt before God, forgiving all of our trespasses because of who He is and all that He has done for us, we are compelled to, re, to redirect our lives for His sake, for His glory, by His will. It is the life that is lived in the shadow of the cross because of who He is. And then He lists four specific things in regard to doing everything in the name of the Lord, doing everything for His name's sake, doing everything for His glory, everything for His gospel, everything for Him, there are four specific things that He lists that capture our attention on Family Month, and that is, number one, wives, submit to your husbands as is fitting with the Lord. 
submit to your husbands. Now, we're not talking about value here. Genesis 1 establishes clearly that male and female are both created in the image of God, right? But Genesis chapter 2 clearly also indicates in creation an order of family life with, with Adam having been created and then Eve created from man and both of them working together. What we're talking about in submission is this mixture of function where the family unit works together for the glory of Christ and the glory of God. And in this age where there's so much conversation about this and in religion, people are falling off both sides of the bridge on it. The call is clear. For the sake of the name of the Lord, for the sake of His glory, for the sake of the gospel, women are to find their place in their marriage with their husband as Christ would have them to be and to serve Him faithfully there. Number two, husbands are to love their wives and quit being harsh with them. Quit being harsh with them. Love your wife. That's a sacrificial love. That means you love them as Christ loved the church, and you set yourself aside. You set what your desires and what you want aside. And your mission, your first ministry in life, husband, is the ministry that you have to the spouse that God gave you. That's your first ministry in life. is to care for her, to love her, to help her become everything that Christ has saved her and purposed her to be. And to do that, you got to quit being harsh with her. You've got to quit being mean-spirited with her. You've got to quit talking to her like she's the family pet. And your words must line up with a heart of love. And if your words are not, then what you might need to question is whether or not you have a heart of love for who and what we are comes forth from our heart. How? Jesus taught us in our what? Words. How we speak to love your wife. Number three, children, you're to obey your parents and you're to do that to please the Lord. You're to subject yourself to them and their instructions for your life. And you're to do that, not just because they're your parents, because you want to please the Lord who died for your sins, who cancels out your debt for His glory. And dads, you are to quit discouraging your children. You're to quit provoking your children. And you are to start nurturing them and encouraging them and building them up. And all of that flows out of chapter 3, verses 1 through 16 and 17. Jesus' death forgives our sins and restores us to right relationship with God and with one another. And doing everything in His name is living that out, is living out God's creative purpose in our lives to His glory and for our joy. It's, it's living out a, 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 a reoriented life that comes from a reprioritized life that causes us to redirect our lives so that even in, in, in the most intimate of human relationships, the family relationship, what is evident is Christ and His glory and His gospel, and His word. We are living as redeemed people. Family was made by God and for God, and until you get that and until you embrace that, your family life will not make sense and you will not be happy. For your family is created for His glory, and your joy is inseparably tied to His glory. Your family life reveals the truth about your spiritual life. Your family life reveals the truth about your spiritual life. So what is your family life really like? And lastly, repent. Verse 6 told us that the wrath of God is becoming because of our rebellious nature. God's wrath is coming upon humanity because humanity has rebelled against God. That if you have been raised with Christ, that's 3.1, you are to put away the things of the rebellious nature in 3.7 because Christ is all in all in, verse 3, 11, in chapter 3, verse 11, and He has set you free from all authorities that once held you in bondage back in chapter 2 and verse 15. All of that being true... To you who are raised in Christ, who this morning 
understand this text and this sermon, I say to you, in Christ, come clean and fess up. Repent. Quit pretending. Quit living a Facebook, Instagram life. Quit acting out on stage and deal with the reality of your life. Repent. Come to be content and happy and in Jesus. You say, well, how can I do that? If you're saved, you can because of what He did. He forgave you trespasses. He canceled the debt. And He overcame all the authorities and powers that would attempt to hold you in bondage. And in Him, by His Spirit, according to His Word, you this morning can, you can in Christ. Reprioritize your life, reorient your life, and redirect your life. But if you've not been raised with Christ, listen to me, you can't come clean. You can't turn over a new leaf and try to make things better. But what you can do by the Spirit of God and the power of God is you can this morning confess Jesus as Lord, and you can believe today that God indeed raised Him from the dead And that it is His death that forgives your sins. It is His death that cancels your debt. It is His death and then His resurrection that breaks the power of sin, the bondage of sin in your life and on your family. Today, you can experience the life-giving, bondage-breaking power of the death and resurrection of Christ in your life, in your marriage, and in your family if you will confess that He is Lord and believe that He lives. This morning I invite you to trust Christ. One final word. Or, not one. It's a thought that will encompass several words. My confession is this. I didn't get this soon enough. I didn't understand this soon enough. Not that we totally fouled up our lives with our kids, or at least I don't think so. Hope not. But looking back, it wasn't what it could have been. And honestly, it it wasn't what it should have been. And maybe some of you my age... Get that. So can I give you some biblical and personal counsel? Can I just speak to you from my heart? To those of you who are in the middle of it, quit pretending nothing's wrong. Quit just scurrying about your day and all the activities, pretending nothing's wrong, hoping it all goes away and everything will be okay. You're just... You're just deceiving yourself, and you're not even doing a good job of that. Your family and others know something is up. Even if they don't know exactly what they know something is up, and I don't know what the something is, but they know something's up. So confess your failings. To whatever degree they were and or are at this very moment, confess them. It may be an affair. It may be you can't break away from the images on a screen. It may be anger in your heart. You can't seem to quit yelling and screaming. It may be as simple that certain things are too important to you. I know that's my big problem. Back a few weeks ago, my wife had told me, and then my daughter texted me. She had, on the way to work, she had run over something. There was a manhole cover or something that was up on the road in Little Rock, and she hit it, and it tore her tire up. And so she just had to pull over and stop, you know. And she had a track record of that kind of thing at home. <laughs> Can I get a witness? Anybody else my age ever have those issues? Okay. And so she had texted me, I texted her back, and I said, yeah, I said, I told your mama that this is Austin's problem now, that's her husband, not mine. And then I texted her back, and I told her, I said, I'm sorry. 
There's a lot of things in life a whole lot more important than a messed up tire, and I'm sorry that I didn't understand that when you were growing up. Because as a dad, that kind of stuff was just an inconvenience to me and a pain in my rear, and I didn't want to deal with it. And it showed up in how I reacted. Maybe you're in the middle of something, or maybe you're like me, and you're getting older and realizing a lot of stuff didn't matter. You know what we all need to do? We need to all swallow our pride and apologize. We need to all experience the grace that we have received from Christ. There's just a lot of stuff. Put your own word in there. It doesn't matter. But there's grace. Maybe that's what we need to do as a church family too. Honestly, I don't think there's a maybe do that. Probably in this room in the church there is this size. There are some things we need to do as a church family. And apologizing, confessing, coming clean, and experiencing the grace of God in our interpersonal relationships. For the sake of the next generation. For our own sake. For the sake of the name of the Lord Jesus, let's give up the Facebook life. Let's quit acting on a stage. And let's experience His grace. Father, forgive us. Forgive us. May the prayers of your people, your families, just rise up to you right now. And hear them, O oh God, and forgive us of our sins. And then direct us to one another, to our son or daughter, to our spouse, to our parent, our grandparent. Even today, direct us there in person with a phone call, a note. And help us to come clean. For some, it's going to be tough. They're going to have to confess an affair. They're going to have to come clean about an addiction. For others, it's just going to be a matter of, I wasn't the dad I should have been. It may be that we were mean-spirited, or it could be that we were on the bottle. God, help us to come to that place today where we're willing to say, I'm sorry. And Father, I pray in every situation, and Father, even in this church, that as people do that, that Your grace would flow, Your mercy would flow, and families and marriages would be restored, and even people's relationships in this church would be restored as Your grace flows in the midst of confession. So God, let that happen, I ask. In Jesus' name. Will you stand as we sing, as we worship? Our pastors are here at the front. The altar is open. There may be even people around you right now, family or others, that you need to take by the hand and say, I love you and I'm sorry. But will you respond to God's call of grace in your life right now, right this moment?